So the history of the uh, paper dust jacket, the removable dust jacket that protects the book, um, is uh, longer than most people think. This book is 1881. It's a Kate Greenaway book, and you'll see that it's a simple design. It's printed in one colour. It has the uh, a few Kate Greenaway illustrations, which of course is the selling point of the book, and it lists all the names of the various people involved in it, and it gives the price of the book. But this dust jacket is really to protect the book while it's in the bookshop from the, uh, the potentially dirty fingers of customers. And when you take the jacket off, the design underneath this jacket is completely unlike the, the design on the jacket. So there's no connection really between the dust jacket. And the idea at this stage is that the dust jacket would be removed the moment you bought the book the bookseller, probably as a courtesy to you, politely remove the dust jacket and would dispose of it and you take the book home without the jacket. So there's no sense that the jacket permanently belongs with the book. So we see some other um, techniques here, the, the way people use the jacket. Uh, this is the earliest known dust jacket actually surviving on any Conrad title and um, you can see that the, the publisher has not advertised the single book which is Typhoon they've made a jacket that suits the whole series so they've listed all the books in the series and if you see there they made a die cut hole in the jacket so that any of the books in the series and I think there are 12 books in the series they can all be put into this same jacket which obviously saves money and it shows the the publisher really advertising things inside on the flaps of course there's more advertising space so they list other novels, not in this series. So you see the, the cheaper ones are listed there. And um, even at the back is more books by the same publisher. It's not by the same author, which you would expect on a modern dust jacket. You'd usually see books by the same author mentioned. But here it's more about the publisher, because the publisher is worried about what's going on in the bookshop, and they're not so concerned to promote the individual author. A different kind of technique um, can be used here. This is a glassine wrapper, which is basically, uh, it's see-through, that's the great advantage of it. It's translucent anyway. The Beatrix Potter titles, this is uh, Mrs. Tittlemouse, has um, a colored illustration on the front, uh, front cover, and you can see it through the glassine. But the glassine is actually not just plain, they put the price on the foot of the spine there. And on the back here, they've listed other Peter Rabbit books. So you can see those. And again, on the flaps, you can see that they're advertising more, more books. This one was published in 1910. You can see a little 1912 inscription in it. So these books would stay in the bookshop protected in these jackets for perhaps one or two years before they sold. Uh, the Beatrix Potter books were, of course, very popular. Um, but again, the idea this jacket is it's, it's impermanent and it's not colour printed. It's just printed in one colour on the glassine. It's not really until the invention of cheap colour printing, when the, 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 the cost of colour printing comes down, that you start to see coloured dust jackets. Now, this is a rather idiosyncratic one. It's on a, a Ronald Furbank book, who's a, sort of the book's an exquisite camp. So there's something rather exquisitely camp about this dust jacket design. It's 1916 and it shows the first sort of, uh, that's about set the start of colour printing coming into, into book dust jackets, actually 1914 onwards. Um, but 1916, there was a, a bit of an explosion of colour jackets. And you see, when you take the jacket off, a very plain book, there's no connection. The, the jacket is pretty and it's, it goes around the book. And of course, if you think about it, you're starting to get an aesthetic where the aesthetic of the jacket, of the colour illustration, matches the book inside. And in that way, you get more of a temptation for the buyer to keep the jacket on the book. It's, it's more part of the book. And that, I suppose, comes to its full fruition in this, which is perhaps the most famous coloured dust jacket ever produced, which is on uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby. There's a, a rather complicated story, a very unusual story, and I think unique, in that uh, the artist who produced this dust jacket was uh, an artist. He'd done a little work in Hollywood, so that's perhaps how he, he came to the attention of the publishers. Um, 
but he put, he was working on a jacket independently of having read Scott Fitzgerald's book. He hadn't read it at all because it was still being written. And he came up with this idea of eyes floating over a town. And he worked through um, the original sketches survive. He worked through five different iterations until he settled on this. And by the time he settled on this, Scott Fitzgerald had written the eyes into the novel. If you remember the novel, there are the billboard, the Oculus billboard with two eyes. They're wearing spectacles in the novel, but they're overlooking the inhabitants of the town and uh, watching what's going on. So this is a famously rare dust jacket because um, it comes from the first, it's from the 1920s, and so it's this explosion of colour, um, but it's one of the most beautiful and atmospheric jackets of that first era. The other thing that uh, you, you see when you look closely at it is that the jacket would be printed, was printed, uh, by, in a separate place to the, to the book. It's not by the same printers, it's a totally different process, and so the printing of the jacket was farmed out. And you can see here that one problem with the jacket is that it's very slightly taller than the book. It's just one of those sort of accidents, you know, the dimensions are given wrong and somebody cuts the jacket a little too large for the book. And so with this book, you always get, when the jacket does survive, which is rare enough, you get these little nicks here and there where the paper's too tall for the book. You also get famously on the, on the, on the Gatsby jacket, they made a mistake, a typing error, which is actually, hand corrected on every jacket where this J Gatsby, the initial J, was printed lower case so that had to be corrected by hand um, which is, um, it's actually a little, people think it's a little hand stamp that the, 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 uh, the jackets were correct, corrected with. But there we are, it's a, it's a gorgeous jacket, uh, very adds to the whole atmosphere of the book and so the chances of, of it surviving um, are increased and yet uh, from this early date, that the old habits died hard. Bookshop owners usually removed the jacket for you when you bought the book, and um, yeah, and that's uh, why they're so rare, why they're so sought after. In the case of the Great Gatsby, with the first edition, if you haven't got the jacket, it's actually uh, printed in quite large numbers. There's the book itself. It's just a, a green cloth. It's got a bit of uh, gilt printing on the spine and there's a blind title, blocked on blind on the front there. So it's, uh, it's uh, not exactly plain, but a book like this costs about 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 pounds, something like that without the jacket. And here it is with the jacket and uh, worth considerably more and more desirable.